Good afternoon, everyone. My name is John Matthew from Impact Innovation Group, and we're working with the Queensland Government to deliver these series of webinars on behalf of the Office of Small Business. Today's topic is creating new ideas for small business with our guest presenter, Dr. Tim McTaggart from QUT Blue Box. Just while we're waiting for other people to connect into the webinar, I'll go through some of the tools we'll be using for those people who haven't viewed a webinar using the Citric Go-To webinar systems before. Your screen should look like this, a slide in the center and a control panel or dashboard on the right. This control panel will climax automatically when you're not using it. So to keep it open, just click the view menu up the top and uncheck the auto hide control panel option. During the webinar, we may ask you questions to better understand your experience with the topic. To respond to these questions, we will ask you to raise your hand. To do that, just click on the little hand icon on the side of the control panel. Remember to lower your hand afterwards just by clicking the icon again. We will also encourage everyone to ask questions that on any of the content featured today. So that the webinar can flow smoothly and we stick to our time allocated, we prefer to answer the questions at the end. However, please feel free to ask questions as they come to you. Just so that we know this function is working, just can we have everyone please press the, uh, raise your, the little blue raise your hand button, please? Wonderful. Thank you so much, Liz, Suzanne, Haley. Awesome. Um, all looking good from this end. We also have to have handouts for you, which you can access and download by clicking on this section. Tim has very kindly agreed to share his slide deck with us, and they have been specifically prepared to help you better understand today's content. They will not be available for download after the completion of the webinar, so I'll remind you again just as the presentation is ending. So now it's time for our presenter. As the world becomes smaller and more connected, small businesses need to work harder than ever to remain competitive. Creating and implementing innovative ideas are central in growing small businesses and in, to ensure they sustain for the future. Innovation can be difficult to understand and implement, but in the last 20 years, Tim McTaggart has built mobile phone telephone, net, uh, telephone networks run construction businesses, delivered gas line projects, under, and undertaken doctoral level research and helped commercialize clean energy technologies. Tim is a dedicated innovation professional who has founded a startup to bring a tech-based consumer product to market, help commercialize a, a concentrated photovoltaic technology and energy storage technology, undertaken research into disruptive technology, and currently trains University of Queensland's future entrepreneurs in all things innovation. So Tim, welcome to the webinar. Thanks, John. Okay, so we got, uh, okay. Uh, and, and good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for taking the time out this afternoon, um, particularly, I guess, as we have Melbourne Cup coming up, so we've probably had a few attendees stolen by that event. Uh, so, but today I want to talk about some tools you can use to look for new ideas uh, you can apply in your business. Unfortunately, I can't give you any silver bullets on creating new ideas. They kind of are driven largely by you know the context of what you're trying to do and, and your customer base but we'll go through a few things um, a lot of what I'll talk about today will be very much focused on you know, seeing uh, what jobs customers are trying to get done which is not necessarily the way innovation gets approached uh, all the time but we'll go through that in the second half but in terms of today there are kind of two things I wanted to cover so one was just general sources of new ideas and places that you can look uh, if you are looking to do something innovative and, and add to your business. And second of all, I just want to go quickly through four tools that you can use to analyse opportunities uh, in the marketplace. So just to get into the first part then, uh, you know, where to look for new ideas. Uh, there are kind of, some people have identified seven areas that you can look. Uh, the unexpected success, uh, incongruities, process needs, industry and market structures and changes in perception or new knowledge and there are varying levels of difficulty of applying each of those with new knowledge being one of the most difficult because it presents one of the most risky ways to, to introduce ideas into your, into your business. One of the basic principles around uh, these sort of seven areas and just looking at innovation in, ge sorry, in general is that innovation can be a systematic process so it's not uh, you know, the stroke of genius in, in the middle of the night that comes up with a good idea. Uh, most good ideas and innovative ideas come from a systematic analysis of 
you know, business opportunities, markets and, and customer needs. And these are what these are really aimed at doing. In terms of where those opportunities reside, um, the first four exist within your industry and company. And so you should have a good knowledge in which to dig into those sort of four areas without looking too far beyond your existing business. Whereas the last three exist within the existing environment. So demographic changes, changes in perception in the marketplace and new knowledge often occur or mostly occur outside of your existing business. So just to unpack each of those a little bit more. So the unexpected. The unexpected can be something that succeeds for unexpected reasons or in unexpected ways. So for example, Twitter was originally created as a communications platform, a one to many communications platform in the company that developed it, not as a broad scale social media communications platform. So that, that succeeded despite the fact that it wasn't designed for the purpose to which it was originally put or finally put. Similarly, the short message service uh, was something which was created in mobile telephones for engineers to communicate to each other directly whilst they were building uh, and tuning mobile phone networks, but it turned out to be one of the most successful innovations in telecommunications in the last 20 years and generates an incredible amount of revenue uh, for people. Uh, similarly, something that fails for unexpected reasons can be a source of innovation. Um, a couple of examples listed here, the Ford Edsel, which is notorious for being a massive flop in the marketplace, but what it did for Ford was to shift their thinking away from targeting and developing products for income groups uh, towards lifestyle groups and in fact was the origins of the Mustang was to, built in response to the failure of the Edsel where Ford realised that the way they were marketing to, to their, their customers uh, had, had moved on or needed to move on. Similarly, 3M created the post-it notes, it's a fairly famous example. Uh, it was a failure from the perspective of the science that was being developed and the purpose that the, the um, adhesive was being used for, but when the researcher took some home, his daughter was using him to put notes on a fridge to communicate with his, his wife and he realised that there was an opportunity there. So one of the reasons that the unexpected is such a good chance for innovation is that people often ignore it or dismiss it or in fact try to avoid addressing those reasons for success or failure and just simply move on to looking at the normal operations of the business. So the unexpected is certainly a good, a good place to look for opportunities. Uh, Incongruities, uh, that's one where there's a difference that exists between you know, expectations and realities. And we've seen this in a couple of instances and, and even more recently. So, for example, in the United States, there was a, this belief, pervasive belief within the US postal system and generally that people weren't willing to pay a premium for delivery of packages and letters. What FedEx found was that, in fact, people were willing to pay for priority delivery, in fact, pay a premium. Um, when the general consensus in the industry was that that wasn't the case. And so there was this incongruity between what people wanted and what people believed everybody wanted. Similarly, we've seen it going the other way, Amazon versus Best Buy, and there was a piece in the media on this on the weekend. So Best Buy is, is thriving in the United States. It's a, a consumer electronics store, not unlike JB Hi-Fi, uh, where Amazon has been sort of sweeping all before it in terms of online uh, ordering and delivery. Best Buy has seen an opportunity in so far as a lot of people were going into shops to, to check on something before they bought it online. But the opportunity they saw was that often people need to understand a bit more about the tech to be able to use it properly. So for example, if you buy a new television or a, a video recorder or a DVD, uh, often there's a bit of a setup process there and you can't learn that from uh, you know, buying on Amazon. Well, so what they did was that they started to have people in store who would help their customers understand not just the tech they were looking to buy, but how they would integrate it into you know, all the other tech that they might have. And at the same time, they would match Amazon's price. So Best Buy has been growing strongly in an environment where a lot of retailers are shutting down in the face of Amazon, because it, again, there's this expectation that people were buying simply for price, but of course the opportunity there was to offer the price but value add by offering these services at the same time in, in store. Uh, the third area of process need, uh, this one's a little bit more complicated, but certainly when innovations are created to support some other process or product, um, it can in fact open the opportunity for a new service. So the creation of ATMs were designed to allow 24-7 banking, but what it did do was freed up tellers to do more value-added tasks, which allowed banks to offer additional products in the banking uh, branches rather than just simply uh, you know, transactional um, events. I mean, Uber Eats is another one. So Uber was created, obviously, uh, to take people from A to B, but it spawned the opportunity to 
effectively and, and cheaply deliver takeaway food to people on demand. And so again, we've seen this evolution of a particular service that has been leveraged into another service again uh, to the benefit of Uber and, and in fact for Uber Eats. Market and industry structure changes is the fourth one. So again, this is the fourth and final one where you can look internally within your business, but certainly changes to industry structures opens up opportunities. I mean, the rise of Amazon, as I was saying before, you know, has created legitimacy. So people were very nervous about buying online uh, not too long ago, but now we'll, we'll, many people will order much of what they buy online, um, and that's legitimised uh, that as a, as a way to purchase things. And so that makes small business online presences more acceptable as well. Now, hopefully most businesses these days have got online presence, uh, not too many don't, but that indicated a, a change in sort of the market structure and industry structure where we, we changed from uh, buying in shop to buying online. Uh, demographic changes, this is one that gets talked about a lot, I guess, uh, you know, the, the shift of a large cohort of baby boomers into aged care and retirement. It's certainly been a focus for many, and aged care is a, is a large area of opportunity. But there are other changes in demographics which open up opportunities for businesses as well. So whilst we've seen uh, that aged care, certainly wealthy baby boomers looking for um, you know, comfortable retirements and, and varying levels of care, but there are other changes in the, in the demographics which create opportunities as well. So for example, the, the sharing economy and younger generations looking to not necessarily own assets but you know, use them when they can uh, on a shared basis is, is opening all sorts of opportunities up for sort of shared economy type business models. And so the demographic changes uh, are not just as people get older, but you know, what sort of behaviours we see in you know, new demographic groups coming through uh, offers opportunities as well. Uh, fifth area, is, uh, sixth area, so change in perception. So this is again is an interesting one. So yeah, where a change in perception, uh, but there's no change in the facts, offers, offers opportunities as well through a change in meaning. A good example of that uh, is that there's been a rise in spending on health uh, products, be it fitness or supplements, over the last sort of 10 or 20 years. And, and in fact, there's been a decrease in people's uh, perception about how healthy they are when in fact all the evidence suggests to us being significantly healthier than we were as a population 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And so there's been this perceptual shift in health and what you need to do to stay healthy and be healthy that's opened up the opportunity for all sorts of health products, be it sort of things like Nutribullet or um, you know, health supplements. So that's certainly a change in perception as opposed to reality um, and not necessarily related to the facts. <coughs> Excuse me. The final area uh, is new knowledge. So new knowledge is obviously a, a great opportunity for innovation and we see a lot of that here at QUT. Um, it can be everything from AI or machine learning or Internet of Things and robotics. Uh, very, very risky approach to uh, innovation. But certainly if you've got access to new knowledge and you've got exclusive access through patents or what other protections you might have, it certainly provides potentially a defendable position in the marketplace, but very, very difficult to implement. Often with new ideas, the market's unproven, as is the product or the service. And so you've got a range of uncertainties which make it very difficult and risky to bring those to market, which is why we see such a high failure rate in sort of new tech innovations in, in, in the startup environment. So, sorry, excuse me. So they're kind of seven areas you can look for, uh, for, for opportunities for your business. Um, if you're interested in, in reading more on that, this book by Peter Drucker has been around for some time. It was first published in 1985, but I'll, I have to say that having studied innovation um, you know, at a university level, I read this after that and what struck me was that a lot of what he says in the book is incredibly insightful and still really relevant. Um, and it, with, unlike a lot of modern innovation texts where things get more complicated, you know, this particular book by Drucker just sort of carved out the basics of um, you know, how to go about innovation in a, in a systematic way within an existing enterprise. So it's definitely worth having a look at. It's fairly cheap on, on, on uh, Amazon if you want to get a copy. A lot of the examples in there are quite outdated obviously, but um, it's still worth having a look at if you get a chance. So they're kind of the seven areas of opportunity for innovation and sort of just a way to think about how you might innovate within your business and, 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 and to your benefit. So now I just want to kind of talk about sort of four tools. I'm, I'm going to have to rattle through these relatively quickly, so hopefully um, you 
get the, the, the general gist of it. I suggest that if any of these look appealing to you, um, I can make some uh, some papers, things like articles from Harvard Business Review available to John via URLs for you to sort of download and have a closer look at if you want to, uh, but it probably needs a little bit more investigation work, but at least it will give you a, 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 an insight into kind of some of the things you, you can do. Okay, so, uh, oh, so one other thing I just want to mention before I do get too far down the track is just that there is a perception I think these days, particularly with things like Uber and, and Facebook and Amazon and Google and Apple, that innovations need to be world changing and that's not the case at all. Um, most innovation starts out quite small and quite low risk and kind of grows over time. And there's a good example of that, whilst it's not the sort of area you guys will be playing in, you know, uh, Intel which introduced the 386 chip in 1985 has been iterating on the basic architecture ever since. So for the last 30 years, they've made $287 billion based on that without any significant uh, innovations, at least, at least compared to the original one. And Microsoft introduced Windows 3.1 in 1985, similarly just been updating it progressively ever since and they've made $325 billion. I hope one of you guys listening goes on to make that sort of money. If you do, please let me know. And, but um, but it just it demonstrates the point that that you can start small uh, without aiming for you know earth-shattering or industry-changing innovations and still be quite successful uh, with innovation. Okay, so just then part two. So four tools to analyse opportunities. Uh, these are the four. So um, I know that kind of sounds a bit academic, and I guess to some extent they are, but but they're quite practical, and I've seen these applied really well by people uh, in smaller businesses. So outcome-driven innovation, uh, transforming your customer's experience, transforming products, services, and the attributes, or redefining your profit drivers. So we'll kind of go through all that. The reason I think these are quite good approaches to looking at analysing innovation opportunities in the marketplace is they give you a tool. Uh, there's a tool associated with each, which is actually relatively easy to use and apply. Um, rather than just sort of being a descriptive method for trying to uh, do innovation in your business. So we start with one, outcome-driven innovation. Uh, this is a, a technique that focuses on the job that customers are trying to get done and, and the way that they assess whether they're being done successfully. Um, part of the problem with often when people kind of go about innovation is that they assume that, for example, that the customer's diagnosis of their problems were right. Uh, customers don't always know how to solve the problem that they have. Um, and also customers you know, often come up with solutions to the problem, particularly when asked very directly about what their problem is, that may not be able to be implemented or cost effectively. Um, and similarly, you know, people could, could copy that fairly easily. And so the outcome-driven innovation really looks at the problems or uh, the jobs that people are trying to get done. So, you know, and then develop that product based on the job, you know, how effectively it helps them achieve that job you know, rather than you know, their perceived problem. So, uh, you know, as people apply this over time, uh, they've recognised that, you know, customers can be quite unreliable in terms of the information they provide around the solution that they need. And similarly, um, you're not good at developing solutions. So, for example, no customer ever asked a market researcher if they wanted a microwave oven, and yet that solves a significant problem or helps a customer get a job done. If, if people had asked before the rise of the microwave, you know, people probably ask for faster ovens, better ovens, hotter ovens, but not a microwave. So again, it just illustrates that there's a degree of input from, from yourselves, knowing the business that you're in and what's possible, but also taking input from the customer in terms of what they're actually trying to achieve. So the key to this, of course, is that customers buy products and services to help them get jobs done. Now, people buy lawnmowers to cut lawns. They buy insurance to limit financial risk and chocolate for en enjoyment or romance or whatever it might be. You know, the great example of, of, of uh, the idea that people don't buy drills, they buy, they're buy they buying holes, not buying drills, right? Because the outcome they really want is a hole. And so that just shifts your perspective potentially on the sort of product that you are going to develop. But again, here the focus is on the job, not the customer. And the customer uses a set of measures to judge how well it's getting done. Uh, and we call those the desired outcomes. Uh, for example, in judging a washing machine, you might measure how quick, how thorough, how efficient, or how quiet the machine is. Um, and you can develop new opportunities by knowing which of these are important and which ones of them are terribly well served by existing products in the market. So we'll get an example of that. So, you know, for a circular saw, um, you know, the job that people are trying to get done is typically cutting wood. Uh, what are the outcomes? You know, how do people measure the success of, of the use of a circular saw? 
you know, they increase the likelihood the blade will begin cutting precisely on the line, minimise the time it takes, minimise the amount of pressure they have to exert, and minimising the frequency in which the cord gets in the way of the final cut path. So again, these are things that you can identify by talking to your customers rather than sort of coming it up with them as a desktop exercise. But the key is to work out what those, those desired outcomes are. The key in kind of constructing one of those and, and using it as a vehicle for innovation is to sort of break it down a bit. So here we want to kind of construct a customer outcome in terms of a direction, a unit of measure and an outcome. So here we've got minimise, so they're looking to make less of something frequency, how often it happens, and what they're actually trying to achieve, how often the cord gets in the way of the cut path, as one example. So here we want to break that down, direction of improvement, unit of measure, and the outcome that people are looking for. So in terms of this, and again looking at the outcomes as opposed to solutions, um, you're not looking for solutions from people, you're just trying to find out what they're trying to achieve. So a good example here, you know, a customer might tell a razor manufacturer that they want a wider handle. You know, in response to being able to hold onto a razor more effectively. So the wider handle might be offered as a solution, but a better option might be a regular size handle with a ribbed or rubberized grip. So customers don't necessarily know the range of possible technical solutions that are available to them, um, and they also have limited knowledge about how one feature might affect other features. For example, how do the handle and the head fit together? And so what you're looking for here is criteria on how they want it, how well a product's meets their needs and not so much their ideas about it. So just it's a word of warning when you go through this kind of a process. So you can identify outcomes at various stages of the customer experience. So here we have, you know, of the job to be done being cutting a piece of wood, plan the cut, adjust the saw, start the cut, operate the saw, complete the cut and maintain it. But within that sort of narrow band of operating the saw, we've got some outcomes that are the user might be looking to, to do or some outcomes. So minimising the time to measure, to cut, and the amount of time it takes to work out what type of cut is best. So we're kind of breaking this down at a fairly granular level about the outcomes that someone's trying to achieve with the product throughout um, the process of using it. So then once you've identified what those outcomes are, we want to uh, prioritise them in terms of the importance to the customer and how satisfied they are with each of them. So an opportunity exists when customers are dissatisfied with how well their important outcomes are being served and you can design a solution that in fact meets those. So the mechanism for doing that and, and, and going through it in a systematic process is a thing called the opportunity algorithm. It's just a simple mathematical formula that makes it possible to discover the most promising areas of innovation. So that algorithm is simply in importance and the maximum of importance minus satisfaction at zero, which sounds a bit abstract, but what it does allow, and I'll show you in a second how that works, to kind of identify opportunities. So here's some research done by Bosch in the circular saws. They looked at a whole stack of outcomes people were looking for in the saw, so you can read them there. And they asked them how important they were and how satisfied they were. So you can see here at the top, minimising the likelihood of going off track when approaching the end of a cut was ranked as the most important feature, but people generally were unhappy with how Bosch's saws performed in that respect. Whereas at the other end of the scale, we've got you know, minimising the likelihood of getting cut, uh, very important to people, but also very well addressed through the current product offerings. And so when you plug that into the opportunity algorithm, you know, the first one at the top, which is how it's ranked, is 15.8 um, through that equation. Whereas minimising the likelihood of getting cut uh, is quite low in terms of the opportunity that exists. Whoop, whoa. So uh, I've kind of explained that. You can look at that later at your own time. And, and the opportunity is to, to target those ones with the, with the high scores. Um, anything over 15 in this case, um, you know, going down, um, you know, 12 to 15 can be low hanging fruit and so forth. You know, an outcome can be overserved when its satisfaction is higher than the importance rating. rating. And the important thing to think about here too, of course, is if you've got a product where people value it, but it's overserved, then you're probably throwing money away by, by over-investing in something that you know, goes beyond what people are looking for. So it's another good way to kind of have a look at your existing offering and just see whether there's a way to rejig it to offer greater value to your customers at a lower price uh, to them at the same time. So here we see just a little, a little bit of a graph. Um, now, so you're looking at these areas, the underserved uh, things that are very important to people, but people aren't particularly satisfied with uh, the greatest opportunity. So here again, just highlighting the underserved features there. Um, 
for the ones to have a look at. And similarly, doing the assessment against uh, your competition. So again, if, if the competition is serving something really well and you're not, <coughs> sorry, that's an opportunity to sort of close the gap. Similarly, if, it's, if there's overserved features, it's an opportunity to potentially strip costs out of your offering without necessarily impacting on, on your customer's user experience. So the way to go about this, <coughs> sorry, is to interview, actually interview customers and identify you know, the jobs and the key customer outcomes that they're trying to achieve. You know, write those outcomes in the form of those outcome statements in the way we looked at it before. So sort of three elements, the direction, uh, what they're trying to achieve and the outcome they're trying to get. You know, go back and interview those same customers after you've done it and just check that they agree with the statements as you've constructed them. Make sure there's been nothing lost in translation and then ask them to rank each outcome in terms of importance and satisfaction. You know, record that and get an overall score. Plug them in the opportunity algorithm and then you can hopefully come up with products and services or modified versions of your existing products and services that meet the underserved needs. So that's just that's one tool you can use. Um, you know, I've seen that one applied really effectively by a couple of small companies. Um, it's a systematic process to go through, analyze your offering, analyze your competitor's offering in the context of what you know your customers really value. Because often there can be a temptation to, to think that you've got the solution, and hopefully you guys probably all realize being in small business, but in the end the customer is the one that decides whether a solution is of value to them or not. And this is just a systematic way to go through and kind of analyze that. So the second strategy, transforming your customer's experience. So this is very much about rearranging the experience that a customer has with your business uh, to, be, again, better achieve their desired outcome. So again, we're looking at very much at what they're trying to achieve as opposed to the mechanics of how you offer it to them. So the tool for that, again, there's a tool that's called consumption chain analysis. And this one's, again, relatively straightforward. Um, what's the consumption chain, you ask, I hear? Um, well, they're a linked set of activities that customers engage in to meet their needs. So here's an example of a consumption chain for a manufactured product. Now, this goes all the way through from when someone first becomes aware of what they might need, you know, be it a washing machine or a circular saw or a car or a business service of some kind. You know, there's a process to go through searching, selecting, ordering, financing, paying, and so forth, all the way through to when people use it the product and in fact even dispose of it in the end because again dispose of a product can be a problematic process for some people and there can be opportunities to innovate around the disposal of a product you know I think that one of those opportunities for example might be as, as we see energy storage come onto the marketplace you know, getting rid of old lithium ion batteries is going to be highly problematic it's probably going to be a, a business opportunity to retrieve and recycle those batteries over time which no one's really having a look at at the moment Similarly, you can do a consumption chain for a service business, similar kind of number of steps yeah, in terms of service encounters, paying, um, whether there's ancillary activities, complaints, dealing with complaints and, re and re uh, renewing contracts. And so the point of all this is to you know, map out that process and, and start to look at it systematically about whether there are opportunities for innovation to add more value to your customer through the process. So a good example we'll go through here is just you know, the, the transformation of music from into the digital world, which again has been happening for some time now, so it's a little bit outdated, but it's still worth having a look at. So, you know, in terms of the consumption chain for music, uh, I mean, the basic process is to acquire music, select music, and, and use it uh, on the right there. And the outcomes you might seek to achieve in that process are you know, minimizing the time to take it, to find it, you know, maximizing customization. As those of you who have done it before, you know, you buy a CD, you get what you're given, whereas now you kind of choose track by track. You're minimizing the cost maximizing the hearing quality, maximizing convenience of use, and maximizing frequency of use. So again, you know, to de derive these desired outcomes, you should talk to your customers. You can do a desktop exercise, but in the end, uh, what you think doesn't really matter. What matters is, is the people's opinions that are going to give you money for your service or your, for your product. But you know, there, there can be these desired outcomes at different stages of this consumption chain. So if you kind of look at the, 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 the big change in, in music between where it used to be consumed and the way it is here, and you can look at this in detail later, but obviously you used to go into a retail store, browse racks, you know, buy a disc with you know, a set of songs on it, pay for it, go home and play it. Whereas now you might get a song referred to you from a friend or recommended from an uh, artificial intelligence like Spotify. Um, you, you then purchase it online and, and away you go and you play it. In fact, these days you can rent it, you don't even need to own it. So, 
the consumption chain for music has, has changed significantly. Again, aimed at not just enable it's enabled by by technology, but not purely for that. It's about you know giving customers a better experience. So if you kind of look at across those dimensions of you know the needs uh, outcomes that customers are trying to achieve, then the digital process is is much better on pretty much every measure, except perhaps for minimising cost. Although that's also better than it has been in the past. Um, Obviously, the companies that have innovated in this space have captured some of that value for themselves. You know, we still pay $15, $18 for what is essentially the equivalent of a CD, whereas in the store it might have been $20, $25. It's obviously a lot less expensive to produce that digitally than it has been to distribute a physical medium, but you know, those companies capture that value for themselves while hopefully also you know, capturing a larger market at the same time. So you know, how do you make use of that consumption chain analysis? Um, First of all, again, map out your customer outcomes, uh, make assumptions, but the idea would go out and talk to your customers and find out you know, what outcomes they're trying to achieve. You know, map the consumption chain, you'd go through and achieving those outcomes. Um, or map your own or map those of a competitor. If you're not in that space already, use a competitor, but ideally do your own. You know, map the alternative consumption chain, showing how it does a better job, and look for a way to, to construct a superior consumption chain. So again, you know, looking at you know, what are you selling, where are you selling it, who are you selling it to, you know, when are you making it available and, and how are you making that available? So again, you know, the music is a good example and probably an extreme example of how the entire um, consumption chain for music has been completely changed and continues to change. Um, but you can do a similar application to your existing business and existing ideas. So you know, here's some, again some examples. Um, you know, strategy could replace the existing consumption chain with an entirely new one and that's essentially what Amazon did by you know, supplying uh, real brick and mortar uh, bookstores in particular in the first instance, but other sorts of uh, purchasing purchases now as well. You know, so can you reshuffle the links in the chain to improve that customer experience? You can digitise uh, to, to combine or replace links in an existing chain, and that's certainly what's happened with online music. Um, you can make some links smarter. So uh, an example we didn't go through here, but you know, Oral B when they put the blue coloured brush bristles in their, their brush heads, the idea with that was that in that whole consumption chain, often people would buy a brush but you don't really know when you should replace it, it's very difficult to tell. And so what Oral-B did was that they put these blue bristles in that wear out over time and so when there's an adequate amount of wear, it's saying to you, well, it's time to go and buy a new toothbrush. And so you know, they've innovated on that whole consumption chain by you know, informing people of the time to go and get a new toothbrush. Now whether they made more money out of that, I don't, I don't know. but but you can anticipate that people would generally speaking replace their toothbrushes a little more often. So you know that's about hassle, informative and user friendly and can you eliminate time delays in the chain? You know, um, ATMs paying bills online, mortgage brokers finding a home loan for you. So can you shorten you know, expensive and frustrating time delays in that overall consumption chain? Um, you know, certainly you see these questions now about you know, people asking, well why can't I track a package that's being sent to me every moment of the day? You know, there's an expectation now that you should know where those things are and so again those sorts of opportunities arise not necessarily uh, at the end of the line or in the purchasing but on that whole consumption chain from, from awareness through to you know, buying use and disposal of a product. So, so that's certainly a reasonable powerful way to have, kind of have a look at, at what you're doing and, and, and what value you're trying to add to your customer but again very much focused on the job that the customer is trying to get done and improving that experience. Okay, so the third one, uh, transforming products, services and their attributes. This is a little bit more complicated. Um, we'll kind of go through it relatively quickly. I mean the thing is that most products or services or offerings are, are, are bundles of attributes or features if you like. Some of those are more important to people than others. And you know, it, as I was sort of saying before, if you underestimate, underinvest in attributes that customer value, you, you risk losing customers. And if you overinvest in attributes that customers don't value, you, you can lose money. So again, with computers these days, most people are buying computers that are way more capable than they need. I know that I only run you know, Microsoft Office and basically you know, Chrome, I don't do anything more powerful than that and yet I've got a fairly, you know, work anyway, powerful laptop. So again, you know, Dell, is, which is the PC I've got, you know, I'm essentially over-investing in, in, in features that don't offer any value so they're losing money even if they're not losing customers. Similarly, you know, if they're underinvesting in their screen or the connectivity or it being, you know, a convertible notepad, uh, which is both a tablet and a notepad, and that's what I value, then they're underinvesting in that because it's, it, I can't take the screen off and use it as a tablet. 
So the aim of this strategy is to maximise the number of attributes your product or service uh, would satisfy customer outcomes better than the competition. So the key questions there are, you know, are all the feet attributes of your product adding value? How do you know? And what's the best mixture of products and services for your customers relative to your competitors? So again, we come back to the example of the circular saw. So again, a good process to, to kind of flush these things out. And in this case, you know, again, we've got this whole stack of features that are underserved because they're important and not being well satisfied. But on the flip side, at the bottom, we've got a whole stack of things that are being overserved and therefore being overinvested in and could be removed from the product without you know, impacting on customer satisfaction. So how do you do this? Uh, that's the attribute map. In this case, this is a tool. So what's that? It describes your offering in terms of what it does to please or displease customer segments. So this is the attribute map. I'll just go to a, a more explanatory version. So there are going to be features within your products that are simply non-negotiable. So for example, um, years ago, uh, when cup holes, for example, were first introduced in the cars, they were a big selling point, believe it or not. Um, I think Honda was the first to do it, and it made a difference to the sales of, of Honda's cars, believe it or not. But of course, over time, everyone just sort of integrated that into their cars as well. And now we have a point where you know, people just expect certain things. Certainly, we're moving to the point where connectivity in cars, where you can you know, connect your phone to the car, is becoming almost a non-negotiable. Whereas in the past, it would have been a differentiator. A lot of the safety performances around auto braking you know, can be uh, discriminators, that, that positive discriminators for your product that help you make sales over competition. And then, of course, the exciters. So things that are even better. So not only do you have it, or a limited number of competitors have it, but you know, it performs better than your competitors. And I guess again, Volvo has done that for a long time in terms of you know, the safety features of their vehicles you know, to get people energised about their products. On the negative side of things, you know, something people will just won't perform very well, but people will simply tolerate it. Um, so if it's a negative, but you do better than your competitors, then that's better, but not as good as you know tolerable. And then, of course, there are some things that that people just simply will not tolerate and need to be you know, engineered out of a product or a service offering as soon as that they can. And then there's some things that people don't really care about. You know, so what's? And those things you only really retain in a product or service offering if it if it allows you to service another market that other than the one you're looking at at the moment. So. The key to this is to, um, you know, is that your, your product uh, offers different attributes. Um, everyone attribute evokes a different uh, response, emotional response from a customer. And this sort of mapping process allows you to map you and your competitors' products to determine if you've got the right mix or not in terms of, you know, leading people to make a purchase. And the innovation opportunity here uh, comes about when you can offer a better mix than your competitors and the right, at the right emotional response. Um, now the thing about this is that it may not be a very durable competitive advantage, but I guess being able to do this on a regular basis uh, to continue developing your product is kind of what gives you that competitive edge in the market over time. So there's a bit more explanation here about uh, you know how those different parts of the attribute map work, um, which you can come back to some good examples here. So basic features again, you know, CD3 and MP3 players in cars originally were a differentiator, but now everyone expects them. In fact, CD players. You probably wouldn't expect to see in vehicles anymore. And you a good example of where you can probably engineer it out of a vehicle uh, in in favour of you know Apple Air, CarPlay and, and Google's system within cars. So just remove those costs because you just don't need them anymore. You know, warranties uh, can be a discriminating feature and you see the sort of seven year warranties on some vehicles and overall value for money on new cars uh, in terms of those motor vehicles. Uh, non-negotiables, you know, safe airline, you wouldn't expect airlines to crash, but generally speaking, um, yeah, that's pretty much non-negotiable in terms of choosing an airline. Differentiator could be additional leg room or free coffee in a waiting lounge, um, and exciters can be perceived extra strain for free, be it, you know, lounge membership or whatever it might be. Uh, tolerables are something you should tolerate, waiting doctors, security searches at the airport, dissatisfiers, um, long delays getting replacement parts for cars, white goods and other products, and things that really annoy you. You know, uncaring or unfair service um, can be those sorts of enrages. So again, you want to kind of just, this is a systematic process to break down your offerings uh, into these sort of categories to work out well, what's adding value, what's helping me make sales and what, what is helping detracting from sales or I'm offering over and above what I need to and it's simply not adding value to customers and therefore could be removed or sort of wound back. So the steps for that again, identifying the job and the key customer outcomes that are important but underserved. Um, stay where you see the opportunity, do that attribute map, which is essentially that table for a key competitor, do your map, compare them, be very specific, as specific as possible in, in, in stating those. So 
you know, how you measure them. Don't just say, well, for nutritious meals, you need to define that uh, specifically. So in this case, offering nutritious meals defined in accordance with national healthy eating guidelines. So that's the kind of the process and that will help you identify opportunities to modify your product to get you know, better traction with your customers um, or to introduce innovation into the product or service offering um, you know, to improve your business. So you know, how, how do you use that? So you can dramatically improve the positives. So in this case, you know, an electric toothbrush um, in terms of you know, quality of outcomes with uh, brushing your teeth. Eliminating tolerables or emerging dissatisfiers. So again, your run flat tyres were acceptable in vehicles for a long time. Now we kind of have you know those uh, compact spares. You're breaking up existing segments. So again, segmenting your market a bit, little bit more closely based on a need that you identify through this process for a particular sub market. You know, infusing your offering with empathy. That's a kind of tough one, but adding a compelling parallel offering, eliminating complexity and cap. You know, so there's a lot of different ways to kind of attack it and, and as always you want to capture the value you deliver. So if you engineer costs out of a product, for example, because it's not adding value to your customer, it doesn't simply reduce that price. Obviously you want to capture some of that for yourself, sort of split the difference. So again, you know, we want to ma maximise these for, for business returns. So that's that's the transforming, transforming your customer experience. Um, and I guess, yeah, just remember that things that are exciters can become non-negotiables pretty quickly and you need to kind of continue to look at your product over time and continue to innovate. Okay, so uh, the fourth one. This one's probably the most complicated of all, so hopefully I'll get the concept across to you uh, relatively quickly. And, and the basic nub of this one is that, you know, as you try and fulfill your customers' needs, everything that you do in a business needs to kind of feed into that explicitly. Um, there's a great example of Southwest Airlines in the US that is a highly profitable point-to-point -point, um, airline that doesn't operate the way traditional airlines operate. Uh, many airlines tried to copy their strategy and failed miserably because they kind of failed to understand how all these different things interlink together um, to add value to the customer and the way they attract. So hopefully I'll explain that uh, a little bit more in, in the next couple of minutes. So uh, the strategy is about identifying key metrics that determine performance in your industry, um, again, customer outcomes they're trying to achieve, and you work those out um, and set goals for each of the tasks that you undertake to try and fulfill those needs. So I'm gonna have to go through this pretty quickly, we'll run out of question time. The, the model is the core model, customer opportunity, outcomes, objectives, activities, and resources. Uh, and I'll show a little diagram that hopefully explains that a little bit more clearly in a sec, but again, you're trying to work out what customers are trying to achieve, translating them into objectives for your business um, and as specifically and measurable as possible, setting targets and basically building resources around it. Now that might sound very simple, but you probably all know having run a business, there's often things that you do that don't directly feed into adding value to the customer and sometimes those things can be uh, just, they just hang around in a business for longer than they should or they need to. Um, so again, we'll kind of go through that quickly, core objectives, uh, and, and one of the key things about these core objectives are, are very much real-time measures. So unlike, say, traditional measures of return on investment or net profitability or gross profitability at the end of a month, that's all rear vision mirror stuff and, and only indicates what's happened in the past. The idea with this is to get down to those tasks and activities that add real value to your customer and track those things in real time because that will allow you to make substantive improvements to what you're, you're doing and the value you're adding to your customer. Um, and ideally you get lagging in leading indicators, so you can read that yourselves. So this is the this is the kind of, I think, the diagram that helps under under explain this. So again, customer outcomes in the case of, uh, you know, um, the airline, they're trying to get cheap, quick, effective flights, uh, point to point. You now they develop this whole set of core objectives that help them achieve that outcome, build activities that, that supported those objectives and built resources around them. So this was kind of a map on a, a measurable core objective. So one of the objectives of Southwest Airlines was high asset utilisation, so having the planes in the air with lots of bums on seats. You know, part of that was maximising flights. Part of maximising flights was choosing the routes, turning planes around very quickly and no delays, takeoff and landing. And here, as a core objectives, and they've developed these metrics that were very specific. So quick turnarounds, 10 to 15 minutes um, to turn the plane around. And they actually had all their staff, be it you know, check-in, uh, baggage loaders, captains, whatever it was, they trained them to say this was our core objectives and this is what you're focused on. So they had baggage handlers that would help check people on the planes. They had pilots that would help load luggage because they're all incentivized and clear on those core metrics that they had to meet in order to meet their customer expectations. And they did it incredibly well and have been and continue to be incredibly successful. 
it's all about those critical activities and key resources that you need to fulfill it. I'll let you go through this down the, down the path later and, and I'll make a paper or a document available that outlines the Southwest Airlines through John and through uh, Impact Innovation Group that kind of explains how this all works. But um, part of the reason, because it was so tightly integrated, people looking from the outside in didn't really understand how it was working. For example, Southwest Airlines chose to have only one single model of aeroplane. They didn't have a variety and they did their own maintenance, which was um, in, in um, which is not what was happening in the, in the airline industry in the US. And the reason they did that wasn't, it was more expensive, but what it did allow was it meant, it meant that when they swapped one plane for another, if there was a technical problem, the pilots knew how to fly it. You know, the maintenance people had economies on spares and they could get planes back onto the tarmac as quickly as possible. Whereas with different types of planes, um, that might make economic sense from a purchasing perspective, but not from the perspective of fulfilling this you know, maximum asset utilization, uh, which was one of their key objectives. So hopefully that's clear. Um, and so how do you use that? So again, identify key customer outcomes, translate those outcomes into competitive and core objectives, convert them into performance objectives, work out what resources you need to fill those and track those um, on a daily basis um, with a suitable set of metrics that your, your people understand. And so that's a good innovation strategy when you've got a similar product or service to competition, but you think you can deliver that more efficiently. Okay, so, so I've had to sort of rip through that pretty quickly. Um, some of these concepts take a, probably an hour to unpack in their own right, but again, it hopefully gives you some pointers towards, and you can go and do more investigation on these yourselves, but some tools that you can use to systematically work through opportunities in your marketplace to um, you know, introduce innovation into your business. So again, just in summary, we've kind of got those places you can look, um, those seven places you can look, and, and Drucker's book's a, a, a short read and a relatively easy read if you want to kind of understand a bit more thinking around that. In there, he also, that book, he also outlines in the back half, you know, how to introduce management processes into a business to ensure that you're sort of innovation orientated. You don't get stuck in kind of that just managing by day, day to day. So it's, it's worth having a look at that as well. And then there's these sort of four tools that you can use. I, I kind of like the outcome driven innovation type of approach. It kind of filters through all the other ones as well. But certainly transforming your customer experience is a, another good one as well. The, the, the last one is more complicated and needs more uh, time to undertake. But in terms of dipping your foot or toe in the water, then the, the outcome driven innovation is, is a great one to start with. Um, and then the only other thing I'd sort of tack this on at the end, I guess, just um, just to give you, again, some uh, food for thought and inspiration perhaps. But again, you can innovate across a whole range of areas, be it offerings, platforms, solutions, customer experiences, processes, you name it. And here's just some examples of what people have done uh, to innovate across those different dimensions of what a business offers. Uh, so hopefully that provides a bit of input and, and sort of, again, a stimulation for thinking about how you might innovate within your own business. So I've gone over a little bit there, so I apologise for that. Hopefully it was, uh, it was valuable. Um, and I guess we're now, it's question time. If anyone's got any questions other than who's going to win the Melbourne Cup, because I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, but otherwise, is uh, who's going to win and who's going to earn the most money, I think. Uh, Tim, yeah. um, well, to, uh, everyone, um, please feel free to ask any questions. We'll start with a few that uh, just come through via email. Um, yeah. First one, do you need to have a culture of innovation in order to innovate within your business? Well, I think that you do. I mean, innovation um, is is a, pro a creative process, right? Although it's still systematic. Um, I mean, part of part often innovative ideas can, can bubble up through the, the business. One of the key challenges with disruptive innovation, which we didn't cover, is that established businesses tend to stifle good ideas because it didn't come from management, it didn't come from people who are in control, and so you don't have to have it. But you're certainly, it's going to make it much easier to innovate if you do have a culture within your business that's open to new ideas and open to change and open to looking at new areas of opportunity, I think. Cool. All right. Um, how important is it to be granular when implementing innovation? Well, I think the more granular you can be, the better. I mean, uh, like all things, um, yeah, the plan itself may not be particularly useful, but it's the process of planning that is. And so the more granular you can be, of course, the more you're likely to understand the needs. So, for example, you're going out and talking to custom, one or two customers will give you a vague or overarching idea of what they might be looking for in terms of what they value, but you're talking to 100 customers will give you a much finer and much more granular understanding. So when we see innovation programs for researchers, when we force them to go out and talk to customers that might actually use their research, um, there's this kind of inflection point. So you talk to sort of five to ten customers, you start to get a general idea, but there'll be 
um, there'll be some things that you hear that are kind of uh, conflicting, um, but it may not be uh, at, at a deeper level they do conflict at all. It's just a perspective on things. You talk to sort of 20 customers and you kind of filter those things out and you're really starting to drill in on what the real value add people are looking for. By the time you get sort of 50 customer interviews, not only do you understand you know, what they're looking for, but you have a much deeper understanding of the what, why, and how, and where they're looking for it. And so, you know, you don't have to be granular, but the more granular you are, you know, the better understanding you're going to have. And of course, that should lead to, you know, producing better outcomes for customers and therefore more sales and better outcomes for your business. Yeah, really good point. Um, in terms of investment, how much should I be investing to create or if, to innovate within my business? Oh, that's a good question. Um, and not one that's a single answer to, really, I suppose. Um, oh, gee, I mean, big corporations can invest anything from a few percent to a, a large percentage in terms of sort of 12, 15 percent of their, their revenue into innovation. It kind of depends what space that you're in and, and what, you're trying to achieve, what you're trying to achieve to some extent. Um, so, yeah, I don't know if I've got a, a clear answer on that. Um, I mean, if you're looking to, if you're looking to innovate, you, this is going to sound like a motherhood statement, you just kind of invest what you need to invest to kind of get the returns that you're looking for. And I know that, that that's a, a bit of a soft answer to the question. I just don't think there's a, a, a definitive percentage because it can vary. I mean, again, if you're in, if you're in, um, you know, the defense industry, you're probably going to put a lot into it. If you run a chain of coffee shops, it's probably a little less. So it kind of depends. Sorry, not a very good answer, but no, the, the truth. It kind of bleeds into this this current question. Um, is there any one industry that should be innovating over any other? No, no, I think there's innovation. I mean, if anything, if, if this sort of move to digitization has demonstrated anything, it's that every industry is open to innovation. And in fact, the ones that look the least innovative are probably the ones that are most susceptible you know, to significant change occurring. So this idea of disruptive innovation. So we see you know, disruptive innovation now moving into media and finance, uh, banking in particular seems to be one of the big areas where people are saying this is the next frontier of disruptive innovation through artificial intelligence and machine learning. So I think that you know the ones, the industries that look the least innovative actually probably present the greatest opportunity for the, you know, for the small company to innovate um, and capture value because the big guys just simply aren't doing anything about it. So you know, if you want to move into the search engine space with Google, good luck. Um, but if you want to kind of innovate around that kind of industrial machinery, for example, then there's probably all sorts of opportunity in that space. So I, I don't think, again, I think all industries should be looking to innovate, uh, and the opportunities probably lie in the ones that appear to be the most stagnant and the most stable. Yeah, good point. Um, this one's a bit of a comment slash question. Uh, I'll just read it out and see how you, you chew over it, Tim. Uh, customers yeah. don't know what they need until I innovate. How do I position my innovation to ensure they buy? Wouldn't I just confuse yep. the consumer with giving them something they don't know they want? Well, potentially. I mean, I guess the key here is to work out what the job they're trying to get done, right? And so, again, it's going back to understanding the job and looking for the gaps. So, again, so let's just say, for example, to try and think of a good, uh, good example, you know, if, if there's some part of a, of a product that's, I mean, the, the great opportunities exist where people are using a product in a way you didn't expect. And this is kind of the unexpected success space. So again, if, if people are kind of cobbling together a solution to overcome a deficiency in existing offering, and you go and talk to them and watch what they do and find out that in fact, you know, um, uh, you know, there's a hole in that process and that's where the real opportunity is. So, so marketing that back to them shouldn't really be a problem. If you're already marketing a problem, a, a solution or a service or a product to them, um, or you're shifting it to say, well, okay, that product our product does this thing, and, and if it really truly is a problem that you've really validated by talking to them, then they should identify with that quite easily, um, and your marketing should all be built around that. So again, it all goes back to you're not guessing what people need and what their problems are and what you know what they're trying to achieve, but actually talking to them and validating it. I mean, it's one of the great mantras of sort of the startup space these days is that anything you might come up with, uh, no matter how experienced you are, is really largely an assumption until you go and talk to the people. Uh, who are going to use it, particularly when you talk about innovation, which essentially means doing something new. Um, and so the more people you talk to about it, you know, the more confidence you, you should have in, in implementing that innovation, and the more success you'll have in eventually selling it. Yeah. Um, I guess this is, uh, again, leading on from the previous statement. Um, I know you've talked about um, 
kind of focusing on the market that you're looking at to making sure that you're meeting that need. But how else would you mitigate risk within while innovating? Well, I think this this process does in fact mitigate the risk. So again, the the big the lessons from the last 15, 20 years, particularly in the tech space, is that if you innovate without talking to your customers, that's a massive risk. Um, you know, if you ever get a chance to ring Eric Eric Rise's book on the lean startup, you know, he'll tell he tells these stories about you know, spending six months developing a product because they knew best, right? They'd been in, this, in an industry around games, I think it was for for years. They they knew what was coming next in tech. They spent all this time hunkering down developing a product and they went to sell it and nobody wanted it. Then they brought people in to look at it and people were playing with it and all of a sudden you know, the developers kind of went, why did you do that? They went, oh, well, I don't want to do that. What I really want to do is this in this situation. And they went, oh. oh, but we thought, oh. And so they developed what the, what, the, what the customer actually wanted, which gave them traction. And so you, know, you, you significantly de-risk this because you can go and talk to customers for free, right? Developing a new product or service is expensive. And you want to know that you're developing that product or service to meet the needs of an existing market through interviews and otherwise before you lay a buck down on doing it. So I would say that you know doing that kind of customer validation research work massively de-risks you know the opportunity. Another good example of that, to, to not to extend the analogy too far, but you're know, working with CSIRO who are now shifting their thinking around commercialising their research. Go figure that one. But you know when they do it. You know, they see if they send a team that's been doing 10 years of research on something, they send them out in the marketplace to talk to customers, and the customers kind of go, "We don't want that." They see it as a win because they're not going to spend another five years channeling funding and manpower and woman power into developing some technology that no one's going to want. So again, you know, I think that just illustrates the fact that talking to your customers uh, and using some of these tools once you've identified opportunities and going talking to customers, I think significantly de-risks it. Um, you know, from a, from a small business perspective. Yeah, very well put. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I will have to lend it there. So thank you everyone for attending the webinar today. Please remember to download Tim's handouts before you exit. This webinar is being recorded and will be uploaded to the Impact Innovation Group YouTube page, should you wish to view it again. Uh, you will receive an email with information about the Queensland um, uh, Office Small Business uh, opportunities and programs, along with a short survey that will help us tailor these webinars to meet your interests and needs. Thank you, Tim, for your time and insight. It's been an absolute pleasure having you. Uh, and thank you, everyone, for tuning in. And have a great Melbourne Cup day. Thanks, John. Have a good one.